about a simple woman's true faith. And so I want to ask you guys, what do people believe it means to have faith? When people talk about having faith, what do they mean by that? Touched by Christ? Other things. Other people things. mean? Your promises? Mm-hmm. Okay. Trust. Trust. You guys are giving me all the good answers. Like, for example, th- think of a think more broadly too. You know, Disney says little song, have faith, little one, little one, till all your hopes and dreams come true, right? So when, when, when the world talks about having faith, what do they mean by that? Faith in yourself. Have faith in yourself? Me, meaning, meaning what? Well, if you're talking about the world, you're assuming that your hopes and dreams in yourself and it will come true. Yeah. It's only Mm-hmm. Yeah, you think. What all the old Disney movies say is that if you believe in yourself with all your heart, your dreams will come true. Yeah, so it's that faith in yourself and in your dreams. Have faith in your dreams. You have a good dream. Just keep believing in it. Doesn't always go well. Yeah. You believe that church. Trusting faith. Trusting Con- faith. Yeah. Common, Com- faith. common faith. Common faith. Everyone yeah. has that. Yeah. I don't know if you guys ever hear this, this argument of faith versus facts, right? They go, faith, you're like, oh, it's just belief, and you have the word now. Facts, you have research, proof, and evidence, <coughs> right? Like, so that's faith is, is the low end. Facts is strong, and, and yet you can always... You can always ask someone, you know, okay, do you, do you have strong confidence in your facts? And you go, you do know the, the, where the word confidence comes from, right? Confidence from the Latin, fides, meaning with faith. What all confidence means is you have, you have faith in something. You have trust in that. You trust that. that faith you guys know for real, it means it just means putting our trust and confidence in something. Disney tells you to put it in your dream. dream. Um, other people tell you to put it in yourself. Some people say put it in, in research. We would argue ultimately put it in God. Now, th- this is a, a, an interesting argument, and we'll, this will tie in quickly here, because when the Reformation happened back in, the, um, back in 1517, as Martin Luther banged the um, the ninety five theses on the on the war on the war on the wall in Wittenberg, Germany. There, there was a long discussion because the Roman Catholics were very strongly against this idea of salvation um, by grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone. They said no, like you you need to do good works, and your good works get you to heaven, or the super holy people who are called the saints. They have extra good works. And so if you can't be good enough, you just need to get some of, some of their good works to go to you, and then you can get to heaven. And they're like, well, if you, if you, can't, you can't say faith, because then that's going to just mean people are just going to, you know, have easy believism at the time. They're just going to say their words, and you're going to say they get to faith. But the reformers talking about this said, no, 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 we got to talk about what faith actually is, how the Bible describes faith. And they came up with three things. Right? They said there's three things of faith. And they used fancy Latin words. The Latin words don't matter, but the concept does, as we'll see. They had um, noticia. So it means to know. To believe in Jesus, we have to know something about him first. You have to know the name Jesus to call upon the name Jesus, right? Um, and we'll come back to that. But then secondly, you also have to 
affirm this truth. Like millions of people know that there was a guy named Jesus Christ, but they do not believe that he was actually God or they do not believe he was actually alive. So saving faith requires a census, the conviction that it is true. Knowing about it, it's, and this is true, I believe in it. And then third, there must be what they called fiducia, which means to entrust it. Because even demons believe that God is one. They believed that Jesus was the Christ, and yet they fight him with every fiber of their being. Right? So th this is what they were saying. It says you, you need to know, you need to believe it's true, and you need to actually trust it. Back to what Inez was saying, you have to actually sit in the chair. Right? One other illustration from... Um, one theologian, he said this, he says, I can go to the airport and I can recognize the fact that there is a plane in front of me. I can acknowledge the fact that the plane and its pilots can hurtle down the runway and leap into the air for sustained flight. I can study the principles of aeronautics and comp comprehend that air rushes over the curved surface. It creates lift, which thus enables the airplane to fly. But I must trust the airplane and its pilot board the aircraft, take my seat, and ride the airplane in order to demonstrate my faith in it. A bare knowledge of Christ and his claims is inefficient for salvation. We must trust that he is the only way to be saved from our sin and the only one who can give eternal life. That makes sense. Like the, the, you can say, oh, I trust, I trust, I trust. You can know all about it, but unless you actually get on that plane and go, it doesn't mean anything. So, Today, we're going to see someone who trusted Jesus fully, who got on the plane, as it were, with what she knew. And she becomes an example to counter the Pharisees who knew a lot but did not consent. Quick review, just remember, chapter 6 was that great big sermon that just blew people's socks off, and he said... You need to call me not just Lord, you need to do what I say. Right? Like, you have to do it. Then chapter 7, we see a number of examples of faith, people trusting God. The centurion had amazing faith as he, it's like, Jesus, you have total authority to heal my beloved servant. I trust you. We saw the struggle of John the Baptist's faith as Jesus didn't really do what Jesus, what, what John thought Jesus was supposed to do. So he was struggling but Jesus assured him, and he called everyone else to follow the king, to be part of the kingdom. The tax collectors who recognized their sin, they followed, and they were like, yes, this is right. The Pharisees and the lawyers, they didn't think they needed salvation. They didn't need to repent, and so they didn't. Now, this last part, we have this final section, how saving faith is exemplified and explained exemplified in this woman, and then Jesus explains it in a parable. And don't worry, Jesus tells, tells us what this parable means. It makes it very easy for us. Now, oh, in uh, verses 36 through 38, we get the faith of the woman. Um, we're going to jump ahead, and I'm going to use those three categories of faith that the Reformers gave to try and help us understand that. Um, verses 36 through 38 One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair on her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. We start off seeing her noticia or her knowledge. What she, she knows. Now, uh, says one of the Pharisees asked to eat with him, being Jesus, and he went to the Pharisee's house. So Pharisee, named Simon again, not a Pharisee, modern day Jew, but probably similar dress. 
Uh, according to Josephus, there were around 6,000 Pharisees all over Israel, a bunch of them. And they were scattered about teaching, keeping people following the laws of God. And it was considered good manners to invite the visiting rabbi over, especially if he had just taught. Jesus had a large crowd following him. So like, all right, Jesus, come sit down. But we see the Pharisees keep doing this throughout the Gospels, not because they want to learn from Jesus, but because they want to catch him. They want to grab him. In, in Luke 6, verse 7, we read, the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath, so they might find a reason to accuse him. Now here again, we have him um, like discussing, or they have him coming in to his house, they were trying to figure out, they were angry with him, and they keep bringing him around. In Luke 14, 3, on a Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of the rulers of the Pharisee, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy, and Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Again, they, they were watching him to try and catch him. So they have him over, but this is not a nice meal. This is a test. They're trying to figure out what they can do. Eating bread together in the ancient is considered like just the friendliest thing you could do. It was intimate fellowship. It, it would be, it's like, I don't know, probably like sharing a jacuzzi together these days. I, I, maybe, maybe, maybe that's not even the close up, but I'd probably like, 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 okay, it's just that. And so to have someone with a knife behind their back as they're eating a meal would be incredibly like shocking to the readers. They're like, what's wrong with these guys? Because there is something. They, they are so angry. They are violating even the norms and customs they lift up. Now, Jesus comes in and he reclines at table, uh, sitting probably in a um, chair like this statue, leaning over on one arm, feet out, back. So painters in the Middle Ages, even today, would present the image like this. Everyone's around a table and the woman's there. But really, you have a person who would sit like this around the table. You'd have an open area where food could be brought in, but everyone would be laying out. And it'd probably be much bigger than this one. So people's feet would be sitting out. There are one more pictures to kind of give the idea. Couches could be set up. Oh, sorry, this one's a little bit... When it got blown up, it got a little bit gr grainy. But you can see on the left and right, you have the table, and you have more couches facing this way. And everyone would have been sitting on some type of couch around here, eating, their feet sticking out around them. So all of us would be around here, leaning on our feet, would be hanging out back. So, um, There is no other way to sit, because they haven't invented chairs like this. <laughs> That's pretty much it, yeah. And, and well, and if you talk, if you talk to some Middle Easterners today, they will still say they're like, "What's wrong with you? You're indig like you're you're hunching over. That's bad for your digestion. Like you need to you need to stretch out, and that's better for your digestion." So they'll make a case for it. I, I've I've seen some people, but back then they didn't have anything. That guy on the left. If I try to eat like that, I'm gonna have back. I'm gonna I, get up. Because that's going to give you back all this Yeah, he's kind of like, he's kind of like, I'll play this. But they, that's, they grew up with this. That's why they yeah, always were doing it. Yeah, it's good. like doing the squatty potties, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, it's like, a good thing because the food up from it goes down. That's right. It, you can have it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, either, it's either that or stand. But a different, different culture, different time. For them, they would have just been like, what? Like, what? You have to basically sit. You have to stand the whole time you're eating. What's wrong with you? Who would want to? Who would want to sit up like that? I don't know. To, to, to be fair, when I was growing up, uh, our table was very low, mm -hmm. like this, this tall. We sit on the ground and, and eat. So yeah. you know, that, to me, that was normal. So I guess I assume you're judging, but we would have just sat cross-legged. Yeah. At a very low table. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and just on a cushion. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't lie down, but I guess if I got tired, I might lie down. It's comfy. Yeah. So to to Luke, this wouldn't be the crazy part. Yeah. <laughs> right. I know. Us, we got we got to get our minds in that culture a little bit. 
But notice verse 37. How does verse 37 start? Behold. Behold. What does that make us try and think when we see that? It's important. Something crazy is about to happen. What happens? A sinful woman enters the scene, a woman of the city who was a sinner when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. So a sinful woman, the word means sinful, sinner. Nothing complicated here. Perhaps uh, missing the mark, you could say the, ana the anatomy of the word is. But what is a sinner? Everybody. Everybody, okay. Is that referring to the type of sexual sin? Mm-hmm. No, why do you say that? Because what did she do? I mean, it's in verse 16. Was she, was, was she a prostitute? No, I think the man was. I think she was, was right? Uh, or maybe she was. I'm trying mm -hmm. to remember. I'm trying to think of it. In another passage, in Philippians 1. Yeah. So Jesus has another, wa another foot washing later on in his ministry that happens in a different place, in a different time. That sometimes you play. So this doesn't say that. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It it does call her a woman of the city. So we don't have clear points of what. Like no one spells out what exactly that means. But you can kind of Im imply a little bit something's going on there. Cities tend to be where those things happen. Um, they knew something was actually. And and who we go we we go a little bit further. What the. Pharisee said he would have known what sort of woman this is, for she is a sinner. The Pharisee knows who she is, which is an interesting thing that, you know. Yeah, why, why, does, he, why does he know that? But there, there also would have been a reputation, like they, they knew certain people live in certain areas, and he would have seen her and be like, you're condemned. Um, so either way, he, he knew who she was. And most commentators actually do believe she is a prostitute. It, it only says she's a sinner. She's a well-known sinner in some way. She has done something. And I know, like, Alan, you're right. Like, we, we're, like, we're all sinners. And yet, throughout the scripture, there is a statement, like in Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the way of scoffers. There is a difference between someone who sins and someone who's known as a sinner, and so there's a reputation here. This isn't just someone who, who sins sometimes. This is someone who's her whole life, and we'll get there in a second. She has very expensive things probably from her sinful life. Yeah, Inez. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There could have been, other, we'll, we'll get there in a second, there could have been other people just hanging around the side, but the fact that what she does is very shocking because she doesn't just stay at the sides and kind of pay attention. She gets right in, she comes right up, right? But Jesus, of course, we know, was friends to these people. Luke, he, he, they already, they've been calling him a friend of sinners. In Luke 15, we're going to see that the sinners are drawn to hear him. So Jesus loves people who are ongoing sinners in need of forgiveness. I'm sorry, Lynn, what were you going to? Yeah, the, the, um, the wicked, the sinners, and the scoffers. So they're separated out. Would the wicked be like murderers? Mm. Or, why, why are they... Probably, because again, being, being poetry, it's more of a statement of just saying, like, it's trying to get a, a picture of all the bad. And so it's giving you a lot of different ways to say all the people who are doing bad and stay away from bad influences. It's basically what Psalm 1 is saying. And then sinners had a bad reputation. They, they were corrupting. Now, the sinful woman knows something about Jesus. What does she know about Jesus? Mm-hmm. 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 She's in, yeah. Mm. 
We don't know. No. The second, the second one was spike fire. Yeah. Yeah, this, this is just perfume, it's just a perfume of some kind. Expensive. Yeah, expensive perfume. Oh, she probably knows Jesus is a friend of sinners, right? She knows Jesus' reputation. Clearly, she's going to him with her troubles, knows she'll listen. And perhaps most obviously, she knows where he is. She, similarly, you know, you know, Jesus will be taught about at a Bible teaching church. Like she knows where to go, right? And she brings an alabaster flask full of perfume. I'm not told exactly what the kind it is, but it is a some type of sweet smelling aroma. Ointment probably should be translated perfume as like a liquid. Is it probably more of a liquid? Some could say like could be, but um, these alabaster jars usually had long necks and they served as containers for these different substances. And so he would have been a precious commodity, very valuable. And so she would have taken this. And we can see in her actions, she knows who Jesus is. In Hebrews 11.3, says, By faith we understand the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Faith requires knowledge. There are certain things that we have to believe about Jesus. He's the Son of God. He's our Savior. He has provided an atonement or salvation for us. Now, the, sir, the centurion knew Jesus was Lord. This woman knows Jesus is Savior, forgiver. And so her knowledge, her, her faith of knowledge, compels her to a faith of a census or conviction. She truly believes this. Verse 38. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet and her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. So we find her standing, wetting, wiping, kissing, anointing him. And, and the details of these words, you can just imagine pictures up in the scene. And maybe, maybe you're on the outer edge, kind of hanging out on the, at these doors, kind of looking in, or maybe you're sitting on the table and this woman comes in. She starts pouring it onto Jesus' feet and everyone's watching her. And even the description is just like, and then she did, and then she did, and then she did. Uh, while this, uh, this is an 1890 painting called The Ointment of Magdalene, uh, this probably we do not see anything that says this is Mary Magdalene. But it's probably a pretty good picture of it. Like Jesus would have been laying out here. This woman would have come up and everyone would have been looking at her going, what in the world is this woman doing? Like, this is crazy here. Well, she, she, she used perfume, it says. So she didn't wash it with water. So she didn't like get out like a bucket of water and wash his feet. And we'll get there in a second. <laughs> because you're like, that's what, but she, she, it's water and tears, or sorry, perfume and tears, no water. Well, if I was a sinner or not a sinner, I would do the same. Yeah, okay. as we should. Yeah. One, one, more, one more picture here, just to get, get us idea. Different drawings. Like here, they went around the table. It would have been pretty easy to come up. This is probably accurate, like where there would have been arches around there. And so she could have easily just come, walked in, and got behind Jesus and started wiping his feet. Yep, yep, we're getting there. Yeah, you're right, exactly. I got, I, got, I, got, I got pictures from Israel to go with this. Yeah. And we know the reason she's doing this, though. Verse 50, Jesus says, go in peace, right? She needs peace. R.C. Sproul writing on this says, this woman was sophisticated, worldly, and rich enough to afford expensive perfume. But the one thing she didn't have was peace. For the only Christ can be peace to the heart of a human being. Her lifestyle was providing for her, clearly, but it was not enough. It's interesting, the word translated wet with tears is the same word used to translate rain falling. God gives the rain. So this, this is not like, if you're right, like, this is not like 
a little bit of tears. Like she is weeping onto him. She is drenching his feet as much as you can drench feet with tears. Big alligator drops. And wasn't it her hair that she used to wipe? Yeah, exactly. And so I got here's a a picture of some braids um, that have been um, preserved over the centuries. <laughs> And usually a woman's hair was, was tied up in braids like this and then tied up again. And so she would have to let her hair down to wipe it. And according to different um, rabbinic traditions, if a woman lets her hair down, that's grounds for divorce in, in the ancient world. So she is going against society's standards right now because she forgot all social surprise, social propriety that's the word I was looking for, for social propriety in her devotion and gratitude to Jesus um possibly but prostitutes wouldn't have done that in public that would have been a private thing so again this is this is actually a very dangerous thing for her to do we'll get there in a second but we talk about she comes and not only does she wipe his feet after she's wiped she's put she's put perfume on it she's cried on it she's wiped on it and she comes and starts kissing it now Israel is real dirty so these are feet of people walking around Israel like you just you just get you, they just get filthy going through the sand and dirt um, so after kind of cleaning them off she starts kissing those dirty feet over and over again kissing especially from a servant to a lord we, we think of kissing as only being romantic but kissing would have been a statement of like please king help me i guess why you think of like oh yeah kissing on the hand like you would kiss the king's hand or the king's ring that that tradition still is in there this is an idea of she's pleading with him please please king please help me so Let's think about this. Why would a woman known as a sinner go to Jesus and throw off social norms? Why, why would a woman who's known as a sinner risk going to Jesus and throwing off all these norms? She knew he was uh, supposed to heal. Mm -hmm. No. The dirtiest part, the most unworthy part. Oh, why, why not go to the temple? There's, there's a religious system at the day. Why, why not just go to the temple, be cleansed? Why not go to the, to the rabbis? I think she was thrown off by the laws of that man. Mm -hmm. So maybe later, you know, there are a lot of men makes a woman uh, feel uh, bad in regards to if they talk to a guy or if, if relationships go wrong. But it takes two to tango. It's mm -hmm. not like, you know, like, you know, her situation, maybe she was fighting off people that were really crazy rapists, people mm -hmm. that she didn't have no place mm -hmm. to go. And we know at least, and we'll get back to that, where Jesus doesn't let, let them play favorites on who gets the blame. Yeah. Um, she is a sinner. So she's choosing this as well. Even if even if bad situations happen to her, she's still chosen it. She's making those. Yeah. 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 And probably the fact that the Bible calls her a sinner, God calls her a sinner, a little more than just bad reputation. But yeah, like she probably had. She probably maybe there was a time she went to someone and it's like I. Yeah. Yeah, and it kind of started falling down that path. Yes. We're speculating right now. It's okay. okay. So why did she not go to the temple? Because she went to the Messiah. She knew he was the one who can save the world. And gratitude for um, the forgiveness of her 
sins, for her to be at his feet for such a humbling act mm. that she just felt like, I'm at your feet um, and grateful for, for what you have done in that uh, well, forgiving her of mm. her sins. I have a question, though, because when she did that, was she, I'm assuming she was already saved. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that mm. she was saying she couldn't be doing that because she was not. But we'll, 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 said, yeah, but, we'll get we'll get there, but yeah. But, but I don't I don't I don't recall mm. in the scriptures as far as at what point she was saved. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. Because I think that would be looking at this. She was saved. It, it is saved mm. there, so I just can't well, he think does. It's a form of gratitude. Yeah, and Jesus recording in progress. <laughs> there we go. It's recording. Um, I don't know, something's so I don't I think maybe there we go okay it's working so remember this is we're talking about elements of faith so it's knowledge and then there's a conviction element here so for example in, in Hebrews 11 1 it says faith is the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen it's, it's confidence in God's promise. To quote from uh, John MacArthur and Richard Mayhew, the mind embraces knowledge, a recognition of understanding of the truth concerning the person and work of Christ. The heart gives assent or a settled confidence and affirmation that Christ's salvation is what we need, is, one, is suitable to one's spiritual need. It, it's what we need. In Hebrews 11, we read Moses, right? Moses, who grew up in Pharaoh's household, he refused to be called Pharaoh's son, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Hebrews 11, 24 and 26. So, saying Moses saw the riches of following Yahweh as being more valuable than the treasures of Egypt. He he didn't just intellectually apprehend and say like, oh, God's more precious. He was persuaded in the depths of his heart. And in the same way, all we know from this woman is she is persuaded in the depths of her heart that she must go to Jesus, that Jesus is her only solution, that Jesus is her only help, and she didn't care about any reproach. What anyone else would say about her, what would come about, she did not care because she had not just knowledge, she had conviction, right? She believed 100%, whatever it took. And that came out in her fiducia or her trust. She trusted Jesus. This kind of goes to the end of the section when Jesus comments on this. And he says to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table began to say among themselves, who is this even who forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. To go back to your point there, Jackie. Yeah, she's, she's come as a saved woman because she believes. Um, again, MacArthur and Mayhew says, the will responds with trust. The personal commitment to an appropriation of Christ as the only hope of salvation. Trust. Not only do I, do I say, I believe, I trust. And we can see the results here. Jesus says her sins are forgiven. Her faith has saved her. But faith is trust. So she's not trusting in her dreams, that all of her dreams will come true. What is she trusting in? She's trusting in Jesus. I I love this quote by Stuart Briscoe says, faith is only as valid as its object. You could have very, you could have tremendous faith in very thin ice and drown. And you could have very little faith in very thick ice and be perfectly secure. That's a good, I, I like that. That was a good image. You're like, you're like yeah, I, I, I could trust the ice will hold me and it won't. Or I could be terrified and be perfectly fine because it depends on what I'm putting my trust in. 
She has saving faith. She believed Jesus, and that's why she devoted herself. Again, Murray says, faith is knowledge passing into conviction and conviction passing into confidence. Faith cannot stop short of self-commitment to Christ, a transference of reliance upon ourselves and our human resources to reliance upon Christ alone for salvation. It is receiving and resting upon him. I got nothing, Jesus. Everything I have, all that I have accumulated, all that I've done is nothing. I must rely upon you. The humility. Uh, this, is, this is what Paul will later talk about in Romans 5, that we have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have access to salvation, to peace, because of Jesus. And so when we trust him... And I, one, more, one more illustration here. I thought it was great. Um, you know, one demonstrates his faith that bread satisfies hunger, not by merely confessing bread satisfies but by eating bread. In the same way, one demonstrates his trust in Christ, not merely by saying, I believe, but by coming to Christ, receiving all that he is and entrusting to him all that the believer is. That's what this woman is doing. She's, she, she is throwing off anything else. Any other option might have been safer. This is very, this is a very dangerous. If Jesus had looked at her and just said, get back, you horrible woman, don't touch me. What, like, and she, she probably would have been stoned for touching a, touching a prophet, right? Like, or, or whatever. Like, you, could, you could imagine her situation, all the risks that could come about. She's like, I can't. I will trust him with whatever happens. Yeah, Jackie? Was she the only woman in that room? We don't know. Um, most likely there would have been other women on the outsides of the room, probably like wives serving food, but probably the only woman to come up around the table, most likely, in that culture of the time. But there probably would have been, because in, in those times, there would have been open spaces. So there would have been people hanging out at the doors, around, there would have been people coming up. There would have been other women, like, listening in, but for her to come up and gather into the group, great risk. Yeah, Victor? If you're in the room in your house, would she be in the presence of God? hmm Because she's repenting of that oh. right now. She, she had no peace because what she, she knew what she was doing was against God. And there was no way to be cleansed. And now Jesus is saying, stop and you're cleansed. Oh, during, um, during the Reformation period, or right beforehand, Martin Luther joined a group of people and went to where people would climb up these long steps on their knees, crying each step of the way, to try and make peace with God, to atone for their sins. Uh, if you haven't seen the Luther movie with, um, oh, I forget the actor's name. Um, I don't know, but it's very, it's, yeah, it's a very, it's a very well-made movie and it tells the story pretty accurately. Joseph and, Fiennes. And Joseph Fiennes. And like the face, the, the face probably gets it really well where he has this moment where he looks up and he's just like, this is horrible. I, I've read my Bible. I've read about the woman who went to Jesus with her sins and her tears, and she was forgiven like that. And these people have to, like, crawl up these stairs crying to try and make God happy with them, and they're not even guaranteed that. They had to pay, too. They had to pay to get there. Like, I, I, and he, he just has a moment just like this, in, in, he's like incredulousness of like, what is going on? This is not right. He's still doing it, though. Yeah. And he realized how silly this is. Going to God and seeking his face is not about self-abasement. Like, this, the sinner's distance from God is not due to any kind of, like, distance spatially, but the distance morally. And God is happy to forgive if we would merely go to him. So, in Luke 7, Jesus says that the woman loved Jesus much. What evidence is there that she loved Jesus? Sacrifice what do you? Possessions, sacrifice of pride. Mm-hmm. Um, just the, the tremendous love sacrifice that she was willing to do. 
Yeah. Now the risk she's taking. Mm-hmm. If you think about it, in the ancient ancient world, they would have they would have cried a lot over deaths, but you didn't cry over your sins. Like that's that's admitting that's admitting there's something wrong with you. You don't do that um, because you know here she is. Suddenly she's going to lose her her job, whatever it is, her sinful lifestyle because she's like, well, she can't keep doing that. Like people are like, oh, are you ashamed of who you are? It's like I I I'm ashamed of who I was, but I'm not anymore. Right? Like that, that's a big change that has to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it's not like God is going to be like, oh, you're going to be in a situation Yeah. We're not sure exactly why she's crying, if she's crying in, in happiness or in sorrow or what, but she is, she, she's, very, she's very passionate about this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, whatever it is we know Jesus says it was out of love that, that's the finding that's the motivation behind her tears she was loving Jesus Yeah. So she's seen they're not they're not caring for him as they should. I must go and do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And probably, and at the very least, it could be she's going above and beyond by the extent of what she's doing. She's she's like going crazy in. Not this isn't just meeting the needs. This is over in abundance. But yeah, I think that could be a motivation that she's going. Well, what what can he need? And then just pouring all of herself in because she's, again, wiping with her tears. Like that's beyond what any hospitable person do. This is a this is a grand statement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Could be. We don't. We don't know. We don't know what what sorrow she what sorrow she felt. But she she went to she went to Jesus knowing he had the answers, whatever it was. So, and we don't have much time left. So let me try and explain this next part quickly because Jesus takes this opportunity of this woman to teach everyone else and lift her up. The commentary by Jesus that he gives, and it starts in his commentary by drawing out the doubt in the Pharisees. So the commentary by Jesus drawing out the doubt, verse 39. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this was who was touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, say it, teacher. So Simon, that Pharisee, looks at Jesus and makes two false assumptions. One, a true prophet would never let a sinful woman touch him. Assumption number two, Jesus doesn't know who this woman is. Therefore, he is not a prophet. But look in verse 39. Who is Simon speaking to these things? He said to who? Himself. Himself. He's saying it himself, and it's in his head. And Jesus instantly responds gently by drawing him into a parable. And Simon says, sure, Lord, tell me. Or is your teacher? Teacher, teach me. Okay. Very clever. Kind of like, um, like Nathan the prophet. 
going to David and being like, David, let me tell you of a man. And David's like, okay, you are that man, right? So the storytelling to disprove the doubt. Jesus tells a little story. He says, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose from whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. So he tells the story of a creditor. Creditors would have records like these stones, which would keep little markings of who owed them what and who was paid off, just like today. You got ledgers, ancient ledgers. And there are two debts that are, Jesus describes at the time. A 500 denarii debt, which a denarii, you recall, it was about a day's wage. So this would be about two years payment, working six days a week. 50, still a big deal, but only about two months. So I looked it up. This might be wrong, but according to Indeed.com, a day laborer in Orange County makes around $18 to $28 an hour. So I did the math, assumed $20 an hour, okay? Eight hour workday, which isn't always true. And you're looking at between $8,000 and $80,000 in today's, um, not, not a tiny amount, right? So both of them owing around $8,000 and $80,000 come, come to the collector and they beg him. And they say, please, we cannot pay this. I had medical bills. My, my, my mom is sick. I've been out injured from work. I cannot pay. Like, please just give me more time. Give me more time. And it says he forgave the debt. Now, now the debt is more than, the word for forgive is more than that. It's the word from grace, which to means to bestow kindness or favor on someone. It's to, out of his goodness, out of his riches, he gives a gift to them. Jesus asked Simon, who will love the debtor more? Now, why does Simon say the one who was forgiven the larger debt? It's common, why is it common sense? Uh, well, it records the financial situation mm -hmm. Yeah. But like because he like did more good to him or he was in like if they were equal in income, it was more burden mm -hmm. for the bigger debtor. Yeah. The greater the greater burden of the greater debt. Yeah, the greater debt, so he like gives the greater burden of Yeah. And so why would that equal more love? Right? We hear these days that the more good you do for someone, the more you love him. Mm -hmm. not yeah, so because it's a greater amount, it's a greater good, and therefore there's a greater love for, for his kindness, yeah. right? Typically, like, these days, the, the understanding is that the one who does good, he also loves mm -hmm. more. Yeah. Because the good he did, he's done. Yeah. So, so the, 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 um, the money lender is actually loving first, yeah. right? Maybe he loves more the guy with the bigger debt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of a Yeah, we're getting there, right? It's like going to the bankruptcy laws, you know, mm -hmm. you want to see what type of a debt it is and if it can be paid. And sometimes if uh, you have debt, companies can charge interest and that's robbing you blind and you don't know so that, that's why there's bankruptcy mm -hmm. laws now sometimes they charge a lot more mm -hmm. so and then they can bring back you know the equalness of oh maybe your the debt is not as great as the interest that was charged or incurred and so yeah and because in those days there weren't laws forcing people to do that this was just a a kindness an act of love, yeah. right? To, to, to bring that down. Yeah. And I, I think 
like there's a point it's just like yeah common sense like if it, there's a sense where the the $80,000 guy like okay that's tough but you know what can make it work $800,000 in debt like and, and with interest I'm never paying that off I, I, I'm going to bankruptcy. Like, there's no way. And so you, you take an impossible situation and you relieve it. Both are bad, but the impossible one just feels all the more like you feel the love of the forgiver. Yes, Sylvia. Because you, you feel like he's forgiving both, right? Yes. Right? But the point of the parable is not to compare, oh, you know, you have worse sin than me. You know, so, so obviously you love Jesus more. You know, his point is actually to go after the Pharisee's heart, to go after Simon's heart. And that's why he asks him, you know, well, uh, which one will love more? And then he points out the differences of faith and love. Because this is really all about Jesus here. This isn't about, about, this is about who is worthy of this love. Because Simon said, there's no way he's a prophet. But Jesus knows Simon's thoughts as he's saying this, proving he's a prophet. He knew this woman was a sinner who owed a great debt to God, and he is pointing out that he can forgive that debt. Something alone God can do. Simon and the woman standing before God is revealed and determined by their attitude towards Jesus. So what Jesus' point ultimately is, is saying, do you love me? Jesus, and if he wasn't God, he would be the most arrogant person in, on the planet to say ultimately like, Everyone's love needs to be directed towards him. Simon's attitude towards Jesus was not so great. He comes in and he does not wash his, his feet when he comes up. Uh, as, as we said earlier, that as still is a custom in many parts of the world, you know, you, you get your feet washed. Traveling in any distance on ground like... These, all kinds of dirty ground. I got a bunch of Israel feet shot. Um, uh, that would produce all kinds of dirty, of dirty, sandy feet. Be out in the dusty streets, hot sun. So people would be given olive oil to allow guests to freshen up. But he didn't get any foot washing. He didn't get any kiss of greeting, as in many cultures still today, a kiss on the cheek is a sign of, of affection. Simon gave no affection towards Jesus because Simon wants to catch Jesus, right? He doesn't even refer to him as Lord or anything. Yeah. Just the teacher. Ah, yes, teacher. Okay, you're, you're, you're here, right? It's like you've shown me not even... There's a little bit of debate over like what's expected, but he's not showing most signs of hospitality at the time. He's not caring for him. But the woman, 
Jesus' point of this parable is that she realizes how great the gift of forgiveness is because she has a great understanding of her sin. And so she has a great love for God. Like she knows that she has been bad. She knows that she's done wrong. And so she loves the forgiver much. Simon, he doesn't think he needs forgiveness. He thinks he's a pretty good guy. No, like, oh yeah, like, you know, I got to go like offer the sacrifices to be cleansed, but like, I don't really need anything. Again, one more quote from R.C. Sproul. It says, love is at the heart of the Christian faith. Love for God, out of which comes an abundance of love and compassion for others. The Apostle Paul writes, If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. This was the Pharisee's problem. He had no love in his heart because he didn't know what it meant to be forgiven. Jesus said, He who is forgiven little, loves little. And, and they're all shocked. Who is this guy who can forgive sins? Like, they, they don't even, um, like, they're, they're not even questioning, like, going, like, okay, is this, you know, he, he's, he's a liar, he's a blasphemer. They're just like, how is he even saying this? And they can't deny him because he has proven himself so many times. I'd probably argue Simon might be wondering, how did he know what I was thinking? <laughs> like, because ultimately, he's God. He has the power of the Spirit, and he's working in it. So, a few minutes over, let me wrap up with this question. Why does forgiveness of worse sins mean more love towards God? You could put worse in parentheses, or in quotation marks there, going there, but why does... Why does someone who feels that their sins are worse and they've been forgiven mean that they have more love towards God? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Newton, who wrote, who wrote Amazing Grace. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's one reason why, um, in his excellent book, The Gospel Primer, Milton Vincent talks about the fact that we need to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. Because we need to remind ourselves every day, I am a sinner saved by grace. I am this person. And to remind ourselves 
have things, the knowledge of what Jesus has done, the conviction that it is true, and ultimately to put my hope into that and saying, I completely trust him.